This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leeuw Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or simply people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is the founding chairman of One World Movement for Global Democracy. It uh, seeks to democratize the international system to make it better suited to tackle the numerous global challenges that it is facing. Odette Gilad, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, Gilad. Hi. Uh, so let me start with a devil's advocate question uh, of sorts. Uh, is it really the right time to talk about a supranational system system? when the United Nations has proved itself as ineffectual in Syria and not for the first time, and the European Union seems to be on the brink of uh, falling apart. Is it really the way forward? I believe so, because you see that the United Nations, which was founded 71 years ago next week, is indeed incapable of facing the problems that we, humanity, are facing together, like climate change, like politics, global poverty and economic gaps and crises like in Syria. So we need something else. And What is the United Nations doing that you think should be done better? Okay, so you look at the structure of this institution. On the face of it, it looks like a democratic organization because you have the General Assembly where all the states of the world are represented. But when you look at it, then you see that actually... governments are represented and not people. And those governments, we know that many of them are not democratic. And then you look at the Security Council, which is something that looks like a world government, but then you look at it and you see that there are the five permanent members of the Security Council that has a veto, and one government that is not democratic can veto any action of the whole world. And this is exactly what happened in Syria, that you had China and Russia vetoing international action on Syria already for four times. So this structure is really threatening all of us. Mm-hmm. So what, what is the uh, vision that you're presenting going to look like? What I'm talking about is quite an old idea that humanity itself will be united in a sort of a federation, that all the countries of the world will share the same vision. constitution and supranational institutions that will check and balance each other from the local to the national to the global level and that could function because we are eventually a global society the people that are affected by the economy by the environment like my people consumerist choices are affecting people all over the world. Mm-hmm. The money that I have in my pension fund is being invested all around the world. So we need the civil a citizens tool to represent the interests of the world citizens and not just the world's consumers and the world's investors. Mm-hmm. But isn't that really a first world problem of sorts? Because most people, as you said, live in undemocratic countries and their are The absence of democracy in their daily lives hits a lot closer to home. It's not just about global warming and global capitalism and global issues, but also very, very uh, concrete issues in their daily lives. Isn't this something that should be tackled first before we move on to set up a global system? So the question is, how can you tackle those questions in the current uh, mechanism by which you have the, all the consumers of the world and all the investors of the world are united through the global corporations, but the human beings are divided to sovereign nation states that are competing against each other. And so you get a situation where one state is divided. sovereignly deciding, independently deciding that they will be a tax haven. And then other countries in the world, they don't get the revenues from their rich people that would support their education system, the welfare state, the health system. And so we are all victims of this. But, but if these governments wanted to do something about it, they would have done it already. But they are all competing against each other. So this is a prisoner's dilemma. 
problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we must have a supranational uh, body that is representing everyone to solve this problem. But, but in order to set it up, you need the goodwill of too many actors who don't have goodwill, as you say. Okay, but we've been already quite close in human history to getting this will done. And maybe it's a good time to do a little review. Please. That uh, if we look at the history, the idea of a world state is very old. You have Socrates, who is saying, I'm a citizen not of Athens or, or of Greece, but of the world. You have uh, Isaiah, the prophet, who talked about a world court, that all the nations will come and will be judged by the same law. Then we see people like Immanuel Kant, that he's talking about getting perpetual peace through global confederacy. And then you get to the 20th century, which is this amazing time in human history where after millennia, the humanity was dominated mainly by empires. The idea is finally losing its legitimacy and people are fighting for independence and democracy. But they ask themselves, okay, so what will the structure be like? And we like to think in the first world that they wanted just to be independent and completely sovereign. But when you look at what they wanted, it wasn't complete sovereignty. They wanted this world federation. And I have here an amazing quote by Mahatma Gandhi, uh -huh. uh, who in 1942, he wrote, If I can get freedom for India now, empire ID dissolves and world state takes its place, in which all the states of the world are free and equal, no state has its military. Okay, so he's talking about global disarmament. But he's saying there may be a world police to keep order in the absence of universal belief in nonviolence. Okay, so he's not a naive person. It's just semi-naive. Well, yes, but no, but he, he's also a realist. Like he, he's understanding that the world that will have no ruler, no government, and no one that is in charge will be an anarchy in which the strong will suppress the weak. And there were many of the kind of like, the first prime minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, look what he says. He's saying, I have no doubt in my mind that the world government must and will come, for there is no other remedy for the world's sickness. It's amazing. It's, it can be an extension of the federal principle, a growth of the idea underlying the United Nations, giving each national unit freedom to fashion its destiny according to its genius, but subject always to the basic covenant of the world government. And you get Einstein, you get Albert Camus, you get Bernard Russell, many people like, especially after the first and after the second world wars, hundreds of thousands of people that were world federalists. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea of how strong this movement was, I have here a decision, a, a resolution by the US Congress from 1949 that reads as follows. It is the sense of the Congress that it should be a fundamental objective of the foreign policy of the United States to support and strengthen the United Nations and to seek its development into a world federation, open to all nations, with defined and limited powers adequate to preserve peace and prevent aggression through the enactment, interpretation, and enforcement of world law. And this is the Americans, when they are talking about world federation, they know what the term federation means. It means losing, giving some of your sovereignty to a higher supranational uh, level that will take decisions with you and for you. But then what happened? You get the Cold War breaks in the early 50s and you get McCarthy. Yeah, that, what I was going to say that in the immediate wake of the Second World War, there was like this very narrow window of opportunity for these lofty ideas that some of them were promoted by world leaders, by states, you know, global statesmen. But the idea, and if you look at India today, as opposed to India of Nehru and Gandhi, these ideas have eroded uh, over the years in the 71 years that have elapsed. D definitely. Definitely. But then you see in the thawing of the Cold War, you see a revival of the idea, especially in social sciences, in international studies. People are starting to think again about this idea. Um, you have professors David Held, economist Danny Roderick, uh, Matthias Archibugi, uh, George Monbiot from The Guardian. You get even Thomas Weiss, who is the president of the International Studies Association in America, and he's giving a lecture, the presidential lecture in 2009, and he's asking, why are we talking about global governance? What happened to the idea of global government? That's the thing that we really need realistically to solve the global 
Uh, problem. But when these theorists uh, tackle these ideas, how do they go about it? Is it really something that is completely egalitarian or some sort of system that is really under the auspices of the great powers, namely the United States? So the idea is definitely to do it egalitarian. Of course, no state, no federation, no democracy is completely equal. But in a state, you have the mechanisms that provide for the rule of law, that everyone are under the same rule of law, justice. You have redistribution of resources, which is something that the world direly needs. So this is really the, the way forward. And, you know, even Yuli Tamir wrote about it in the year 2000. She wrote a chapter about, named... The Israeli politician and philosopher. Yeah, yeah she, she wrote, uh, Who is afraid of a world state? And she is analyzing this question and shows that this is a really necessary idea that we need to discuss and think in order to understand the problems of the current state that we are locked in. Mm -hmm. Sure, but as I said, we seem to be moving further away from these ideas rather than closer to them if you look at the way um, the European Union is perceived by the European people, by the grassroots. So once you like, look at Brexit, okay, so you have uh, the European Union, the, this process of the European unification span across many decades and it always had some kind of difficulty. It wasn't a plain line, but the interesting thing about it is that throughout the process, it has never taken a step backwards. And now the Brits have uh, voted for Brexit, but it still hasn't happened. They're still negotiating it. Now you hear that Scotland wants to withdraw from the UK and then people will might rethink it and maybe... Sure, not, but, but regardless of Brexit, yeah. the ratings of the European Union, even in other member states that don't really uh, consider leaving the European Union, is horrible. It's very, very low. I mean, people have very little faith in a supranational structure. They have very little faith in their national uh, structure as well, but even less so in a supranational one. So, supranational. Uh, of, of course, and I would say that this is a problem of local states in a global world because the powers that are destroying the European Union and make it unfeasible and, and not properly democratic are uh, I would say the global forces uh, that are unrained and unrestrained and therefore therefore, United the, the European Union is a great example of how nations can come together but it is still very problematic and not the type of organization that we really need mm -hmm. and you know that in 1998 I'm talking about again the, the thawing of the, of the Cold War yeah. so you had the World Federalist Movement who is the same movement from 1947 from the after the first world war that they led the international coalition for the international criminal court which by the way the state of israel has for decades it has been very supportive of the icc mm -hmm. creation because the jewish people have suffered the maybe the gravest crime against humanity that there ever was and by the way the icc is also in the way of realizing the idea of isaiah the prophet they talked yeah. about and they succeeded and now we have this court but still of course it is not functioning properly because even if you have a judiciary authority there is a question of okay who is writing the laws that the court is running by mm -hmm. okay and so, who's uh, responsible for enforcing them too exactly so uh now we have a campaign for a world parliament exactly this week that uh, this is the anniversary of the united nations Activists around all the world are taking actions to uh, talk about these uh, things and to analyze critically the problems of the current international system and institutions and to talk about the need for mm. a global democratic uh, order. Uh, uh, is it all over the world? I, w I want to ask you about your association. Why set it up in Israel, in a small country, but by no means the capital of decision-making, global decision-making, and also a country that is diplomatically cut off from large chunks of the world. What's really the purpose of that? Okay, so actually we are a new Amuta that was established here two years ago, but we are a part of the international body, the World Federalist Movement, which is the umbrella organization in New York. 
which represents organizations from all around the world that are talking about this issue. How, how many branches do they have worldwide? Something like 30. Mm-hmm. And we thought that it is very important to have a representation of this organization, of these ideas also in Israel, which is the place that you really see how the idea of a nation state doesn't properly fit in with democracy and religion and two nations are fighting here for the same land and of course this is also you have global issues here that the Jews came here from Europe and international politics are playing out here also so I'm happy to announce that we just uh, opened up our uh, website called oneworld.network mm-hmm. where you People can find more information about this in English as well it is actually in English oh, uh, we, okay. we will translate it into Hebrew I and see. probably uh, and hopefully Arabic also in uh, on the f- further Did, this year do you have any point people with the Israeli government or Israeli decision makers people that you can lobby and sell your ideas to okay so a part of the campaign for a world Parliament so the way that they do it is we speak about first of all to have a Uh, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly that will give representation uh, to parliamentarians from all over the world and uh, it has been endorsed by 1,500 current and former parliamentarians including eight Israeli parliamentarians. Uh-huh. Okay. okay, so uh, th- that's a path that we take. And now another thing that p- if people are interested to hear more, there is a lecture coming up next week at the offices of the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Fund The title is Humanity Without Borders, Outlines of a Vision for a Global Democracy. Mm-hmm. So it will be next Tuesday, right after Sukkot. Mm-hmm. And then... Here, but, 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 here in Tel Aviv. But, here in Tel Aviv, and it, this will be in Hebrew. But then, if people want, uh, the 21st of November, we are going to open up a course in English about global democracy and global justice mm-hmm. that uh, will take place in Tel Aviv and will discuss all those issues and campaigns in Israel. In depth and uh, I invite people to uh, fantastic so do I so to all you listeners out there who want to further their uh, acquaintance with this really fascinating and cutting-edge topic I encourage you all to follow up on uh, Oded's uh, valuable work Oded Gilad thank you very much for joining us today thank you Gilad and also big thanks to Alex Benish the sound engineer and to the Van Leer Institute for the generous support if you like this podcast there are many more where it came from just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcast and take your pick also check out our new website telavivreview.org and like us on Facebook you can follow me on Twitter Gilad underscore Halpern I tweet mainly about the review and also don't hesitate to get in touch with your comments and suggestions join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>